In this video, I'm going to show you how to design locking mechanisms right into your 3D printed models to give you that oh so satisfying snap. Let's get started. How's it going guys? Angus here from Makers Muse. If you're 3D printing objects that need to join together in some sort of way in a permanent or semi-permanent basis, you have a few options. A lot of people will use like fasteners, like nuts and bolts, or maybe even glue. However, if you're clever during the design phase, you can actually design locking mechanisms right into the part and then 3D print it without any additional hardware. And what I wanted to do for a while is make a video on my process for creating locking mechanisms because I've used them many times in the past on projects here on Makers Muse. But consider this a part one because there are oh so many designs out there. However, this video is gonna be focusing more on the style you might find on boxes with catches or on buckles you might find on backpacks. However, before we proceed, what I think is a great idea is to get some inspiration and research from existing objects you probably have lying around your house that have built-in locking devices. So let's go over to some that I've got set aside. All right, so what I have in front of me are some great product examples of snaps or clasps, clasps or clips or whatever you want to call them, ways of keeping things closed or snapped together if there's various components. And there's different approaches, many, many different approaches, but also different design intent because some of these are designed to be opened regularly, some of them are designed to be locked together permanently. So let's start with this box here, which is a great waterproof case. And this has these two clips here. And these have a really satisfying snap like that. So in this circumstance, these are designed to stay closed by themselves. Nothing, no external force will open them unless the user actually intently, uh, intentionally opens them up with a fair amount of force. Now the way the designers achieved this is by creating these components with a very small lip here on the underside of this part there. And that comes around and snaps to this component here on the, in the injection mold. So this has been reinforced with ribs and it comes around and deforms slightly and then snaps underneath it. So because of the way the box opens, this will not, trying to open it this way will not do anything, but you actually have to in, intentionally undo this and again, deform the plastic slightly to get it open and you have to do it twice, which gives a degree of protection, which is what you want for a waterproof box. So in this case, it's quite a well-designed snap and because the plastic will only deform slightly, this is gonna last a long time. Anyway, so that's this little box here. It's a great example of a fairly high-end snapping design. So let's look at something a fair bit cheaper. Let's look at this pen box. Now this actually has two snaps, one there, one there, and it's designed to snap this plastic cover in place. Now this is just packaging and it's actually quite clever how they've done it because it has to be as cheap as possible. And the thing about this design is it's just a sort of semi-permanent snap. Like you don't need much force to open this. It's not really designed to be all that strong. It just kind of holds the cover in place and that's its only purpose. It's not really holding any load. And the way they've achieved this is similar to the uh, waterproof box in that there's a little tiny snap here. And if I can show that on the camera, it's again, a very, very small bump, which comes around. And on this part of the case, there's a little lip and the bump comes around and then deforms into that lip. And then once it's underneath it, the bump will kind of lock into place. So it's not gonna be the easy, the, the strongest thing. You can see there, doesn't take much to put it into place, but it also doesn't take much to pull it out. But again, in this circumstance, you don't want a pen box that no one can open. Next, we have this, and this is actually designed to never come apart again. This has internal snaps that you can't access once the product is assembled. And it's just a cheap uh, like wall light with a battery in it. You can access the battery component, thankfully. But to get into this, we're gonna actually have to use a screwdriver to jam into it to show you the snaps. So if I get my screwdriver here, I'm trying to be as careful as possible, work it in. Hear that snap, that's the uh, internal catches releasing. <laughs> Pretty violent. And you can see here and there are these internal snaps, exactly the same approach as the boxes, but once they snap in place, which we're gonna do again here, 
you can no longer access them and they're not removable. So this is an example of a permanent snapping design, permanent locking design built into each half of the case to lock it together without any glues or fasteners. And finally, the star of the show, we have this, which is a buckle design. Now, this is what I'm taking my inspiration from. And although this looks very different to the box designs, it's actually quite similar. What we're gonna have is these, these prongs deform as they go into the other component. And then they'll spring out once they reach the point where they actually can lock in. And this part here behind these prongs will actually be what locks into the uh, buckle here. Now it's a bit of an exotic design. You don't need to make it this complicated, but there you go. So that snap, they've deformed and then snapped into that edge right there. And this is now permanently locked unless the user comes in and releases them. So let me just draw on paper for you the basic principles of how all of these mechanisms I just showed you work. You have a ramp like this on a prong and this comes up and then it meets some plastic, which will be like that. And then as it comes up, it'll deform to go along the edge of that plastic until it reaches a ledge. So this will actually deform and then it'll snap up into this ledge like this. And then once it snaps into place, these ledges, this edge, will actually prevent it from going back out again. And this is how all of these designs work. And it's very easy with a bit of careful consideration to design a 3D printed part that can take advantage of this system where the part will deform slightly and then snap into position and then stay there. Or if you want, make it be able to be removed via either by the user interacting with it or if enough force is applied in the opposite direction. Before I draw anything in CAD, I like to research exactly how it's gonna to go together. So this is an exploration into the buckle I just showed you from the bag. And that design was a little bit exotic. I was, as I was mentioned, it's got some weird shapes you don't need, but this is the more simplified design. So this is using that ramp, which rides up and then hits a ledge and then will go from being deformed to snapping back out into that ledge. But something I didn't draw in this case was the ability to release it because you need to get your fingers in and you need to snap it free. And my first version of this didn't allow for that and I couldn't snap it free. And you can see here, this is my exploration of how the actual plastic cases worked. And this is the snap from the top of the box. So this is the top and it's got this snap here that has that little bump. And then the plastic case bottom part had that receptacle that allowed for that bump either by having a form like that or it just literally had a ledge like that above it. So depending on the shape of that nub, for example, if it's like this with an angle top and bottom, it can be removed and put back in place with just force. But if the top part is just flat or in some cases maybe a little bit angled negatively, it's gonna completely lock into place and you won't be able to remove it. Okay, here we are in Fusion 360 and this is my final buckle design. And what I'm gonna do is roll back the timeline and step you through my steps to creating this in Fusion 360. It's not gonna be a full tutorial on how to draw it because this is considered an advanced kind of thing, but I'm gonna show you my considerations to actually making it work, especially considering that we're using 3D printing. Now the buckles on the bag were made using mass production techniques, um, injection molding, which has very different considerations to the design than what we're doing with 3D printing. We have very different constraints and very different uh, benefits to using the technology. So let me just roll back and I'll show you from the first sketch to how I actually drew this buckle. To begin, I drew the internal part of the buckle and this is created using a single sketch and an extrude. So let me just show you the sketch here. And something I do recommend is to have a ruler on hand whenever you're 3D modeling stuff because on the screen, it looks way larger than it does in real life. As an example, this buckle, we're taking the idea of the, the sort of uh, ledge here that hooks in and then snaps into place. This is two millimeters across and uh, two millimeters in the screen looks massive, but in real life, it's absolutely tiny. <laughs> um, and this means that when we insert this buckle, those prongs are gonna deform by that two millimeters until they get to that point where they can snap, snap out onto the ledge. And because they are deforming, we need to give the plastic room to deform. That's the most important thing about these snap fasteners. The plastic has to be able to deform, which is why this distance is important because we have this long thin piece of plastic here, which allows this to deform slightly and then snap back into place. So we're using the elasticity of the plastic to make the snap fastener. So that distance is important too, because if the, the ledge was, for example, just down here and it was on solid plastic, 
it's not going to work. The plastic can't deform and snap back into place. It's just going to crush and it or it won't work at all, basically. So that's why we need to have this gap here and allows this this sort of rod here to deform this prong to deform slightly. I went with 2.2 millimeters. You might want to play around with this depending on how thick the fastener ends up being and what works for you. And changing this to be thicker means that it will deform less because there's more plastic, but it might have a stronger snapback action. And then thinner means it will deform easier, but it might not be as strong. Also that distance is important too. I played around with it a little bit um, and I found that this distance was quite good for working with the ABS plastic and probably work with PLA as well but you can't have it solid. That's the most important thing. The plastic needs to be able to deform. This middle post as well is important. It's actually not used to fasten it in any way. It doesn't snap into place. It's simply to guide the buckle in. And again, I got inspiration for this from the bag buckle, but it's important because when you're sliding this in place, if this post wasn't here um, and well, it wasn't guiding it in, you might go in at a weird skewed angle and it might easily snap the prongs on each side because they're only 2.2 millimeters thick. Um, across which is quite thin so this post actually helps guide the buckle in and keeps it perfectly straight and parallel till it snaps into place and also helps us release it because we can release both sides at once and then pull it out I then extruded this buckle by four millimeters which again looks quite chunky on the screen but have your handy ruler it's actually pretty small and then I started drawing the outside component that acts for this buckle to snap into place. I then added a simple radius there, um, which actually removes the stress rises from those internal corners. So you're less likely to get the plastic to crack there. Um, you could have, I could have added this in the sketch stage, but for some reason I prefer to use fillets uh, separately to the sketches in Fusion. Adding fillets to the sketch itself can get rid of your uh, dimensions sometimes, and it means I can change it easily. But that's just simply to remove any stress rises. And then the next step was to draw the outside buckle, the receptacle for the internal buckle to snap into place. And I started by doing that with this sketch here. Now people who use Fusion 360 would be like, well, you didn't dimension that Angus. Well, I did and it's locked into place, but for some reason the latest version of Fusion doesn't uh, turn the sketches black, which means they're defined when they are projected off something. I'm not sure why, but uh, the reason I did project this from the internal buckle is to start getting clearances. And as I mentioned, clearances are really critical for 3D printing because 3D printing is not perfect and you need a bit of wiggle room for the parts to actually, you know, go in with consideration that the plastic isn't going to extrude correctly all the time. It's not going to be completely accurate. So I actually went with a 0.3 millimeter clearance here. I thought I might have mentioned 0.2. That probably will work as well, but 0.3 is nice and generous. And you can easily change that if it doesn't work for you by just editing this. And because it's projected, it will automatically snap to that projection um, of the uh, internal buckle. So if, you know, if 0 0.2, for example, makes the clearances a little bit tighter. Then I gave it a wall thickness of 1.8 from the buckle, but because we've got that clearance, it's gonna be 1.5. But again, that's okay. That's fine for the strength of the uh, external buckle. And then I extruded this out. Um, and I extruded this out way up here because I wanted room to add like a little little area here as if it was a real buckle where you'd have maybe a, a bit of um, material that attaches to it. Again, this is not designed for any real use. It's not going to be strong enough. But just to get that look, I extended past where I would need the buckle to actually function because I wanted room to add that little loop. Next, we need to cut some slots into the outside of the buckle to allow for our little snaps to snap into place. And this is what allows this to function. So again, I did a sketch where I added a bit of uh, clearance. So I projected off that um, original little hook and I projected off that a, uh, a offset of 0 0.3. So a nice 0 0.3 millimeter clearance. And then I extended that up to the top of the buckle here with another projected line. So what this ends up with is a slot. So what you can see here using a cross section analysis is we've got that original uh, internal buckle with the little little hook that goes out and then we've got a nice 0.3 millimeter clearance there to give it enough room for consideration with the 3d printing process and you can see already that this will deform as it comes up and then snaps into place uh, and then I simply mirrored that extrude to the other side and this would basically work now if I just turn off the section analysis uh, that would pretty much work 
but it's not going to be stopped from continuing onwards. So that's what we need to do next. We need to actually add in details that will stop it from going too far. Oh, and I also added some chamfers here just because if you were going to add material, you'd want it to be a little bit more rounded and chamfers are better for 3D printing than fillets. <laughs> uh, but that's not really important for what we're doing now. This, however, is important. This is where we actually are going to constrain that middle post. And uh, look, I understand this might be pretty messy, but it's the way I model stuff. And it's done by projecting. If I do an analysis, I got some projected lines off that internal post. And then I offset that to give us some clearance. So I offset it, I believe. There you go, 0 0.3 again. So I use 0 0.3 millimeter clearances for everything on this model, I think. So I offset that line by 0 0.3. And then I offset the curve as well, 0 0.3. I gave it an overall thickness of 2, but again, there's, there's a little bit less than 2 because of that 0 0.3 clearance. And then I just brought it all the way up to the top here. Um, this is a little bit messy because I tweaked things over time. Originally, these posts were just, they stopped here, but I decided I wanted to give the buckle a bit of a different design. So they don't need to be rounded like this. They could just go all the way up. <laughs> uh, but when you're working with CAD, sometimes you end up with messy details like that. Uh, and then it's extruded to both halves of the outside buckle uh, to show you the, how the extrude works there. I'll just turn off section analysis. You can see that I've extruded from that point. So the plane was the bottom half of the internal bottom half of the buckle. And then I extruded to object. You can see here to object. And then with that, you can select the surface you want to extrude to like this. And I extruded to that. And what this gives us is that guide. So that internal post is really critical to guiding the buckle up and uh, not deviating and possibly breaking the prongs off of our little catches here. It was at this point that I sort of realized after doing some tests that it was difficult to undo this buckle by hand. So what I ended up doing is just adding a bit more of a, a catch to it so I could get my finger in. Uh, you could have done this right at the start, but I didn't want to damage any of the projected sketches. So I just added this here as a separate component because I didn't know if I wanted to make it bigger or smaller or get rid of it completely. Um, sometimes you want to do that when you're doing extrudes of things that you might want to change. You might want to do them separately instead of all in one sketch because if you change too much of one sketch that everything's based off, it can blow up the, the CAD model and it can stop working. So I just did it separately like this to see how it felt with my fingers. And then I just did that as a mirror like this so I could get in and grab it from both sides. Next, I decided to add some uh, aesthetic details. So I decided to add cut throughs through the model. So turning off um, the, the section analysis there, I just added some cut through holes like this. Um, they're very much just for aesthetic purposes. So I could see the deformation of those prongs inside the uh, buckle. You don't need them. They're just added there as a simple sketch. And then I added some uh, fillets. I'm not sure where those fillets are. <laughs> what are these? What are these? Oh, that's right. I added some fillets just to blend in that catch a little bit easier. Again, that could have been done in the sketch phase, but I do like to add fillets separately. And again, this might not be the best way to model, but this is how I generally do these sort of components that don't need to be related in assemblies and joints and that kind of thing. You know, they're very simple, really. But I can hide the outside body here when I'm working on the inside buckle and then likewise I can hide the inside if I'm working on the outside. So next I decided to add a chamfer around the entire internal part of the buckle. And the reason I did this is because when you're printing on the Prusa Mark III or most 3D printers, the first layer tends to be a bit too close. You do that for bed adhesion, but it means it can sort of uh, squish out a bit. So adding this tiny little chamfer means the first layer is a bit more in and it's not going to squish out too much and ruin your clearances and tolerances. Because if we didn't have that, and I show you here, it might squish out too much and then it won't be able to go into the buckle. But by adding that, that chamfer around it, it just gives us a little bit more clearance for the edges of the buckle. Even though we've got a good generous clearance of 0.3 all around, it still can stop it working in my experience. Okay, turning on our section analysis again, we've got a great buckle, but you can't get your fingers in to release it yet, can you? Well, we can do that by adding some cutaways. So I just added a nice, easy sort of circular cutaway to where the prongs are, and they basically allow you to get your fingers in from both sides and release it. And at this point, the buckle would work perfectly. It's gonna go in, deform, there's enough room here for it to deform. And then once it gets into place, you see this prong is actually being stopped by these posts. 
so it's not going to go too far. Um, and then when you want to release it, you squeeze it, it's going to deform again, you can pull it out again. So everything from this point onwards is just me printing it up and making it have the same uh, sort of belt loop on the top than the bottom. So I just added a top, top shelf here in simple extrude. Then I added the cut. And then I did another extrude which filled in around that cut. So this is only affecting that outside part of the buckle. And it's just letting me add a bit of detail. Then I did another cut which actually cut down the thickness of that buckle. Just by doing extrude along the side. And then I added some nice pretty chamfers. Like this. And like that. Yeah, that's how I drew this buckle. So, again, showing the section analysis. You can see clearly how the buckle functions and I highly recommend having a ruler on hand to check your dimensions as you're going to make sure you're not doing anything too small and again to recap what you need to consider is you need to consider the material has to deform and also you need to consider that you're 3D printing so you need to figure out is it going to be able to be 3D printable uh, without needing support material and that so I'll just very quickly show you in, in the slicer how I printed these and why they don't need support material. Okay, what I have here is the latest Prusa slicer from Prusa Research. And this is a great little slicer, and I use it for my Prusa Mark III. So, here we have the two belt buckle parts, the inside and outside. And we need to consider how we're going to 3D print them for um, good material strength. And also, we don't want to have any support material. So, the inside is easy. It just prints flat in the bed. And the reason we want to do this is because we want these nice long prongs to be strong. If they were printed vertically, they'd be, have very small uh, layer, very bad layer adhesion, because each layer is like a wood grain, and we want that grain to work in our advantage, not against us. So lying flat, very easy. Buckle, though, uh, we don't want it to lie flat, do we? Because it's got these openings and all that, and it's not going to print without support material. So we need to actually change the orientation of the, the uh, outside buckle to be like this. There we go. So that way it's going to print vertically and these overhangs can bridge um, for the most part. This one does have a little bit of a messy inside which you don't really see um, but you'll, when I do the slicer preview you'll see what I mean about being able to bridge without needing support material. So in terms of my settings uh, I like to print these buckle parts with as high infill as possible and I do that by actually increasing the perimeters. So actually six is a nice high number and that, that inside buckle part will actually be all perimeters basically and very strong. It's almost going to have no infill at all. Top, bottom layers, the same, that's all fine. And layer height, this isn't a precise part, 0 0.4, 0 0.2, sorry, is totally fine for layer height. So I'm going to slice these bad boys and you'll see here exactly how they're printed. And I highly recommend watching your G-code preview to make sure stuff works before committing it. So you can see this high amount of perimeters makes this part almost solid, which is going to be very strong. And you can see how as we build up, the buckle has various bridges at various heights. So it starts a bridge here, goes up, keeps going, does some steep overhangs, does a bridge there across the whole thing, keeps going, and then does another bridge at the top there. Um, now, that those bridges are pretty much fine, except uh, this one is going to be a little bit messy. It's over. It's overhanging a uh, fairly open area, but it's inside the buckle. We don't really care. It's going to be a very strong print, very high perimeters, and shouldn't take too long to print an hour. Okay. Now, it's, I mean, the, it's, the Prusa Slicer settings are pretty pretty conservative, but that's going to be pretty good to print and pretty easy. So I'm going to show you my results. Alrighty, so these are my buckle designs. So like I mentioned, there might be one of three main use cases. You might have a buckle that you want to be locked, except when the user interacts with it and then they remove it. You might want one that remains permanently locked for uh, tamper resistance. Or you might want one that actually can self-release with the right sort of force in either direction to make it something that you can just push on or pull on and it'll come off with enough force applied, otherwise it generally holds its place, like we saw in the different case designs in the mass-produced objects. So let's begin with one where it's locked in place until the user interacts with it. So you can see here with this buckle design, 
there's a nice long thin section here which allows for that deformation which is critical for allowing this to work. If this was solid plastic, like I showed in the CAD, uh, I mentioned during the CAD process, this wouldn't flex and it wouldn't work. So you need that ability to deform to make these connections work. So with that in mind, it goes in place and then snaps in. You can see those little uh, snaps come away. The buckle is now locked and they're snapped into that position there. So these have a flat bottom, which means that it's 90 degrees from the, the direction here, which means it locks in really nicely. And you can apply lots of force. It's not going to come off until the user comes along, pushes on them to push them off that ledge, and then they come out. So again, showing that nice and closely, this is the ledge here. This is the buckle inside, pushes up, and then snaps in and now that's locked. All right, but what about one that can lock in place, but then be removed if enough force is applied? Well, I've got a few versions of that. So I tried different angles on the underside instead of just flat 90 degrees, which gives us various different forces required to remove the part. So let's start with this one, which is the easiest to remove because it's got the most uh, subtle angle here. It's way off 90 degrees, it's actually 45 degrees. So when you put it in place, is there's barely a snap at all, and also with just a bit of force, comes away. Now you still do need force to pull it away, but this might be a great safety catch where you don't want too much force to remove it, but you want something to just kind of stay in place, you know, under its own weight, but then you can pull it off, but you can change the angle of this to make it come away at different amounts of, uh, with a different amounts of force. So for example, these four have different angles from 20 degrees up to 90, and the 90 degree one will lock in place, so we won't use that one yet. But let's start with, uh, let's find out just by trying them which one locks in the most. So let's try this one first. All right, that one needed quite a bit of force. So I'm gonna say this one's the 20 degree one. That's 20 degrees from, um, from that flat, by the way. This one, a lot less force. And this one, I'd say middle of the ground. So I'd say we've got 20, 25 and 30 degrees and I can tell that just by the amount of force I need to pull them apart. And this can be really useful for fine tuning just how much force you need to remove something in terms of a locking device. Um, again, you might have a catch that you need to hold something strongly, but if you know if the load exceeds what the components can, can survive, then why not make the buckle release? But I do want to stress that none of these should be used for life dependent applications. Oh my God, please. This is not designed to hold anything important or strategic. The 3D print will fail fairly easily. This is not nearly as strong as an injection molded buckle. Please uh, do not use this for anything critical. This is just for fun 3D printed projects and a great example of how you can design things with various use cases with different slight, just very small tweaks to the overall design. And let's finish up with a permanent buckle. So one that goes in place and then you can't easily remove. This might be useful like we saw with the light where you know this designed to just snap in place and never come apart. You might want a connection which can't be easily removed by the, by the person using the product. And in that case, we're gonna use our nice nine degree um, angle uh, buckle. And in this case, I've changed this uh, receptacle to have a very small opening. So you still need that lip for the buckle to land on and lock in place. But in this circumstance, compared to this one, you can see that there's no big opening to get into it. So it's gonna be difficult to remove. And if this was completely covered, this would be a one-way trip. There's no way to ever be able to get this to open without probably breaking it. So let's try our buckle, put it in, and then you should be able to see as it goes in, snaps in, and now that's done. That's very much in place and I cannot remove that. I can't get my fingers in to remove it. The only way you can probably do it is using a implement, which I'm sure people are familiar with taking apart electronics to get in, push it down out of the way, and then try to push this one out of the way, and then try to just kind of nudge them out like that. And even, even doing this with a large 3D print, it's difficult, there you go. All right, so I managed to just push them out of the way. You can see how they're deformed there. You can see they're deformed out, and that means that I can easily pull them out again. Now, just to recap, like I mentioned during the CAD phase, the most important aspects to consider when designing snaps and locking mechanisms in 3D prints are the fact that the material needs room to deform, so you need to give it a nice amount of room to deform, and you need to give it that clearance required to fit together. So this is all designed with a 0.2 millimeter clearance. You can hear the parts 
a little bit loose inside. And then you also need to consider the material properties. So this is PLA, but in this circumstance, this is ABS, which gives us just a little bit more flex than PLA in my circumstance. PLA probably works fine. I mean, this one, this one was PLA, but I've made that a little bit longer. This one's a little bit shorter and a little bit thinner. And in this circumstance, um, ABS is probably a little bit more suitable. And finally, you have to remember that when you design stuff, things look huge on CAD that will be absolutely microscopic in the real world. This actually has a chamfer all around it and you can't tell. And like when you're working with millimeters, things can look massive in the drawing because you scaled right in. But keep in mind that this buckle looked massive, but in real life, it's pretty small. So when you're designing stuff, give yourself a reality check now and then grab a ruler, check the size of stuff in, in the real world and see actually, hey, that's pretty small. I'm sweating the small stuff. Actually, I need to worry about making this usable. And when you get those things correct, after a few attempts of just trial and error, you'll get really, really good results. I guarantee it. So there you have it. That's my belt buckle design. And I'm really, really pleased with this. I can easily incorporate it into many of my future projects. But why stop there? This style of catch uses that ramp and then it locks into position. So why not have lots of them? So this is sort of a linear ratchet. And this is actually how a zip tie works. A zip tie is a lot smaller and injection molded, but it's the same approach. We have this linear ratchet. And it's a little locking device that deforms and locks into position as it moves along. And normally these aren't removable, but I thought to myself with 3D printing, because this test worked, can you 3D print a functional zip tie? Well, it turns out you can. And this was the result. And this is actually really interesting for a number of reasons. For a start, the design actually worked, but notice how flexible this is. This is not your standard 3D printing filament. This is actually glass filled polypropylene. So polypropylene is a really tough plastic often used in like the cases I just showed before. But for 3D printing, it's fairly uncommon because it doesn't really stick very well to the print surface. Well, I found out that if you just use polypropylene tape, like packing tape, it prints really, really easily. And Stefan over at CNC Kitchen has a whole video on 3D printing polypropylene. Once you get it down, it's actually pretty, pretty easy to print and really, really in, really unique because it's so flexible and tough. So this 3D printed zip tie works just like the real deal. You put it together and then it zips up and the polypropylene with the, with the glass fill is actually tough enough and um, rigid enough to hold that locking mechanism in place, but it's flexible enough to actually form that zip tie uh, shape. And that's gonna do it guys. Thank you so much for watching. It's been really fun exploring these designs, this crazy 3D printed zip tie and these uh, belt buckle style connections. And if you want to uh, test out these models, there's a link below and they're also free on Patreon as a thanks to my wonderful Patreon supporters. Uh, you can 3D print them or they'll also be the Fusion 360 source files. So you can go in, dig deep, find out how I made them, reverse engineer it and modify it for your own projects. And if you did find this video useful, please do consider subscribing to Maker's Muse because it is my aim on this channel to empower your creativity through technology. And hopefully I've done that in this video today. And I look forward to seeing you again very shortly. Catch study guys. Bye.